Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. I help patients to treat their hearing loss so that they can remain independent and connect better with their family and friends. The reason I'm so passionate about this is because I lost my brother Robbie twice to hearing loss, or twice. I lost him first to hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again to the tumor itself. I'm also the the founder of Arizona Hearing Center, where I am the E of ENT. I only take care of ears. I've treated over 10,000 patients with surgery and treated many thousands of patients with hearing loss. I'm the author, author of Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. You can find more out about the book and purchase it at www.listenuphearing.com. And if you want to learn more about my clinical practice, you can go to www.azhear.com. Today, I'm very excited. I have Lisa Skinner. She's a behavioral expert in Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. She has been a community um, counselor, a regional director of a senior illicit facility, a trainer, a speaker, and a private advisor helping thousands of families negotiate dementia. She received her bachelor's degree from uh, California State University, Sacramento. Not only is she a professional dealing with uh, and counselor dealing with dementia, but she's actually had personal experience. She's had eight family members who had Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. All of this excellent experience has led her to write a two times best-selling book, which is Not All Who Wander Need to Be Lost. It's available on Amazon, which is offers guidelines to those who must deal with patients who and family of Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm really excited to have her on the show today. Lisa, welcome to my show and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So tell me a little about it. You know, wh- what is your journey to where you are today? In other words, how did you become interested in this area and this field? I mean, I know you have personal experience and I'm sorry for that or glad for that because it makes you an expert, but uh, tell me how you got to this place. To be honest with you, it was kind of an accident. Usually is. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it was an accident on purpose because I believe that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, that's great. Uh, my very first experience experience with um, an Alzheimer's type disease that causes dementia was with my grandmother and I. That was back in my teen years. And it was a pretty compelling experience for me, the way she was treated. It was back kind of in the day where you didn't talk about it. It was very taboo. And it wasn't even called Alzheimer's disease. It was called senile dementia. Right. right. It was very close to my grandmother. So that experience really um, stuck in my, my heart and my memory throughout all these years. And then after I uh, graduated, uh, from college with a degree in um, human behavior, which I was just absolutely fascinated by, I accidentally got a job in upstate, rural upstate New York. I was living there for a short time as a community counselor at a memory care facility and assisted living facility. And that's where I started counseling families on. Uh, memory loss. And my experiences just grew from there. I um, was a regional director for the largest assisted living company out there years ago. And one of my, I had, I managed five buildings and I set up uh, memory care units and I trained the staff on how that they're very specialized skills on how to care for people with cognitive loss. It's very different from caring for people with medical problems. So, so what are those skills? So when somebody's looking for somebody, like what, I mean, I'm not saying I totally believe you. What, what are they? What, what things should somebody look for in the skills of those people? People who have been um, strategically trained on signs to look for, behaviors to look for, but most importantly, how one responds to those behaviors. When people have cognitive loss, they eventually lose their ability to reason, to make sound judgments. Um, personalities change. They lose 
a lot of a lot of them lose their ability to not only communicate but also articulate their wants and their needs. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Find alternative ways to tell a caregiver or a loved one that there's something wrong. There's there's a, a dire want and a dire need because they can't express it. They can't articulate it. So if if I came to you and said, hey, I think somebody in my family has uh, dementia, what type of questions would you ask or what should I be looking out for? Um, well, I've done thousands of assessments sure. personally, so I know what questions to ask and what to look for. But if you came to me as a client when I had my consulting business, I would ask you why you were suspicious. Sure. And then listen to your answers and try to determine whether or not these they sound consistent. red flags or maybe just signs of normal aging or if there was really a bigger problem. So what are some of the red flags that people would say? Well, this, in your experience. This is kind of the rub. It's very difficult for doctors to diagnose um, Alzheimer's disease or other diseases. There's over 70 brain diseases that cause dementia. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And it's very difficult for doctors to diagnose in the early stages. Well, I always say the family members are the experts, right? Because they're with them all day, yeah. all the but time. The... the um, the signs and the symptomology is very subtle in the beginning and might go unnoticed until it progresses. So there's a fine line between wondering whether or not somebody just has normal um, forgetfulness due sure. to the normal aging process, or if that person really is in the beginning stages of a more serious brain illness. So here are a couple examples. Okay, great. We've all misplaced our keys, right? Correct, correct. Yes, yes, yeah. I have. <laughs> or our glasses, where are they? Oh, they're on top of your head. Right, right. Um, that's perfectly normal. It happens to all of us. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about me lately is I'll be trying to think of a name and then whoosh, it's just out of my head. Sure, sure. And the harder I try to think of it, the more <laughs> it right, right. Will come to me. Right but I know I don't have dementia. So these are all things that um, are very common to all of us at one point or another. Um, one of the biggest differences between somebody that has um, dementia and just normal aging is, so if you found your keys, you go, oh, there are my keys. And then off you run to the store. Right. Somebody with dementia might pick up a set of keys and they'll look at it and they would have absolutely no clue what they're supposed to do with a set of keys in their hand. They uh, don't remember the function of it. So that's a big difference, right? The misplacement versus actually forgetting fundamentally what a key is for. Right. Um, people who have dementia, and these, this is, of course, in the mid to later stages, because most people aren't actually even diagnosed until they're already in their mid stages. They can live with uh, the subtle signs and symptoms for years before it progresses to where it's blatantly obvious. And then a lot of family members kind of reflect back and they, uh, it all fits together, right? Oh, <laughs> now in hindsight, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that is very common that really catches people's attention is not being able to find the right words for things. Right. And actually confabulating and and adding something into the conversation that they just make up as a placeholder because they can't remember what's supposed to be there. Whether right. it's, you know, they're talking about a restaurant and they're telling a story. So and repetitive behaviors are um, a huge sign of somebody that has cognitive decline because they don't remember that they just asked you a question or they just told you that story. So they repeat it in the same uh, conversation over and over. As and if it's new again each time, right? As exactly as if it was, they're just telling it to you for the first time and you're going, oh my goodness, didn't I just hear that 12 times? 
It's so, do you have any advice like for people to try to catch it earlier or what they should do? Is there anything to do or is it just something you say, well, it's okay if I catch it later than earlier? You want to try to catch it earlier because there are medications available that doctors can prescribe. There's a new one that just came out recently. It's kind of controversial. Right, but about the only, approval, right? It only works on people that are still in mild cognitive impairment and it has not progressed to actual Alzheimer's disease or right. so. Um, but the medications that are available the Aricept and then Namenda and the Exelon patch, they only work for a given period of time. There is no cure. There, um, there is no getting better. But what these medications do is, is they just prolong the advancement of the illness. So I don't know. It depends how people look at it. If they look at that as being um, a positive measure or um, just prolonging the inevitable. Because well, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, my passion in the dementia space comes from, I don't know if you've seen it, but The Lancet did a big report on dementia in 2018, and they talked about what is modifiable. And mm -hmm. so uh, they talked about, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, exercise. Those all are about 2% modifiable factors. Hearing loss is a 9% modifiable factor, meaning it's a, almost a five-fold impactful. So where our world's intersect is because people with untreated hearing loss have a higher incidence of memory problems and dementia. So that's and a huge thing. Exactly. And what you're saying is very true. People ask me all the time, what are my chances or how do I know if I'm at risk of developing dementia? Well, just like you said, there are many, many risk factors that go into the equation. Right. The number one risk factor is age. And we can't do a thing about that. Right. Right. And that's why I said modifiable. <laughs> Age is not modifiable. As you know, you can't, uh, you can't reverse that. And then you have your manageable um, right. condition. So hearing loss is a manageable one. Right. If, if you have hearing loss and that puts your risk of developing dementia way up here, if you get hearing aids and manage that and can hear again, then you've just lowered that risk uh, you've negated that, that condition. Because well, you're using less brain energy, right? Cause your, your communication's easier and then you can use, you can find those words and remember what keys are and all of those things. So now correct me if I'm wrong, but what I read about the link between memory loss and hearing loss is when you, when you can't, can't hear in one or both ears, it actually causes atrophying to the brain. The brain yeah. shrinks. So they've done brain scans that demonstrate that. So that's the physical manifestation. And there are multiple theories, right? So one is, um, you know, cognitive load, right? And so if you, when people can't hear, they don't just say, I can't communicate. They use speech reading, looking at people's mouth and lips, and they use context to kind of fill in the blank. That takes a higher cognitive load. And so that persistent cognitive load, they believe one of the theories is that it leads to dementia because you're shunting brain energy over. Uh, the other thing which is clear is, is is social connectivity, right? So if you're socially withdrawn, and so that I believe is something you'll touch on is how social connectivity is so important. And people who even have mild dementia, I believe, you could correct me, when they are more socially connected, they actually, their symptoms are less. Is that not correct? That is 100% true. Yeah. And what you said is uh, also my understanding that hearing loss, as we all know, that does lead to isolation because you kind of feel left out. You can't hear what people are saying. And people don't want to repeat either. And people don't want to repeat. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about that. Like in terms of, uh, you know, are there things in terms of like it, it, people can do? I mean, does Sudoku help doing brain activities help with this stuff or they don't really know? Or we it don't absolutely know. does. And there have been many, many studies that have um, kind of filled in that blank. Um, lifestyle changes, um, brain exercises, staying active, walking is one of the best things that you can do. Um, more along the lines of a Mediterranean style um, diet, I'm so good. whole grains and fish fruits and fruits and vegetables, and fish, less red meat, maybe not so much cheese. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but what I what I explain because I do a segment on how a person can lower their risk of developing later on in life. If you're listening to this and you're twenty something years old or thirty something years old, start these things now, right? Because you will lower your risk of developing dementia after the age of 65. Yeah. The old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right? Exactly. Right. So um, again, the, there's many risks that go into the equation. There are the ones that are modifiable and the ones that are manageable. Every risk that pertains to you that can be modified or managed, you want to pay attention to those because uh, managing them will negate that from being a high risk factor. And the more high risk factors you have, the higher risk you have of developing dementia later on. It doesn't mean you will. Because right. It's, well, it's like anything. If you exercise, it doesn't mean you won't get a heart attack, but it lowers your risk of heart attack, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. So tell me about, uh, this is your book, Not a Who Wander Need Be Lost. It's a great book. Tell me about the origin, like what led to you writing a book? You know, somebody has to say, like, I gotta, I have to write a book about that. But what was, what was the drive to let you, to get you to, to write it? Well, there's a story to that. I know, and I want to know it. <laughs> so I had um, a consulting business. Right. I not only gave advice and taught tools and tips for how to, uh, manage the day-to-day -day challenges and obstacles and behaviors, people living with dementia, but also for their family members so they could have a better quality relationship. And I also helped place people, people in, in those facilities, right? In facilities, yeah. Um, so I was called over to this client's house one day. She was at her wit's end. Her name was Lisa, too. And her father-in-law had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease about two years earlier. Mm. And her husband's mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease about wow. time. That's a lot. Dealing with it on both sides of the family. Sure. And they were very frustrated because after the initial diagnoses of, um, of their parents, they were just... They didn't, You're on your own. Figure it out. Right? They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what resources were available. They didn't. They were having a hard time finding information. So anyway, they called me over and they asked me questions for about two and a half hours. Wow. Lisa That's stopped a lot. me one day or she stopped me after about two and a half hours. And she said, you know, at Lisa, I just want to tell you that you have provided us with more information in the last two and a half hours on the day-to-day -day challenges that we have to deal with than we've been able to get from anywhere else in the last two years. And she says to me, she goes, you need to write a book. Mm. She said, you have to share this information with people because they just can't find it and they're desperate for it. Well, it's more than the one-on-one, -on -one, right? If you can't, you, you, if you don't write the book, you can only do it one person to one person, right? Exactly. But the thing that's interesting is I had been hearing this for decades from various family members. They were all telling me the same thing. And even though I was aware of it and I had thought about the book, the way she presented it to me was my aha moment. And I left there. I go, she's right. I need to participate in raising awareness because this is such a heartbreaking disease for families and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. People with dementia can live very enriched, fulfilled um, lives, but it's like learning a new language. And like, people with family members with dementia can too. Yes. And one of you the can enjoy their relationship with that person with dementia if they are given the right tools, right? Well, that's exactly right. Instead of feeling frustrated and guilty right. and angry and all the different emotions that kind of, you know, flare up. Uh, it's a long process. Some people live with this disease for 20 years. Well, it's actually, I, I'll confess to you, I, I, you know, when I have patients and I talk to them, sometimes their family member will outwardly say they they have dementia. Right. And it's a, it always hits me as a point of uncomfortableness. And it really shouldn't where like a spouse says about another spouse that they have dementia. Right. It's just a matter of fact thing. But I go, 
oh, I, can't, I mean, I feel bad for the person who has dementia, but I, I assume they know it and acknowledge it like any other condition. And to piggyback on something you said earlier um, pertaining to hearing loss, you sure. know, you have to compensate for the loss. So you, instead of just kind of not being able to communicate with people anymore or them with you because you think you can't hear what they're saying, you learn alternative ways to communicate. Yeah, I think right. you mentioned speech uh, reading, looking at people's, because you can tell the difference between wife and wife. And that's why people say, when people turn away from me, I can't hear them. It's like, no, you can't hear them when you just can't see their lips and you can't compensate. And there's also, um, Sign language. Correct. So people so start developing develop their own. A lot of different ways to uh, communicate with people who have hearing impairment. Right. Well, this is exactly the same situation with cognitive impairment. Right. And so he, does motor recall last longer than perhaps word recall? You see what I'm saying? Like, do people it, know the signs longer than they do the words sometimes? Well, it depends on what is causing the dementia. Ah, uh, makes sense. Right. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's the one that we're most familiar with. Right. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is short-term memory loss and confusion. Right. But there is so much more to that disease than just memory loss and confusion. There are uh, the things that we mentioned or I mentioned earlier, you lose your ability to reason and to task sequence. So, you know, we get up every every day and we go in the bathroom and brush our teeth and we know exactly which steps to sequence to make that activity happen. Take the toothbrush out of the holder and run it under the water. People uh, with dementia lose the ability to put... Put the toothpaste on before they brush their teeth. Yeah, or getting dressed. Right. Or um, they forget how to use a coffee maker where before it was just second nature. You get up in the morning, you practically do it in your sleep. Right. right. You lose the ability to do all of these because of the damage being done to the brain and different parts of the brain. So it becomes um, a very complicated situation. And eventually people who suffer from dementia are going to need help and care with all activities of daily living. So it's a spe it's a, a continuum, I guess, right? Uh, they're independent to uh, being, unfortunately, not independent, right? It's a, it, they kind of progress through a continuum of the dementia. Yes, depending which model you follow, the Alzheimer's Association uses a three stage model, uh, yeah. stage one, stage two, stage three. But I've seen seven stage models before. I usually follow the Alzheimer's Association. So what are those three stages? I, I'm not familiar with this. It'd be great to learn about. about okay. so this is actually once it's developed into dementia, you have stage one, and then they they um, there's a list of uh, symptoms and things. Symptoms and signs. And then there's the mid sta stage, and then there's the um, the last stage. Okay, great. But before that, you probably have heard this term before, mild cognitive impairment. Correct. Seems like a large basket. It is. It's before they actually um, kind of... Give the formal diagnosis. Right. Because all things, a lot of things can change once you have that diagnosis, like what type of facility you can go into and things like that. So mild cognitive impairment, people can are still pretty independent and can do a lot of things for themselves, but there are noticeable signs of something going on. Right. Cognitive impairment doesn't always progress into Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a degenerative disease. You just might, because you could have had infarcts, right? You could have blood a loss from scarring in your vessels in your brain, and that doesn't progress. Well, that right? is the cause of vascular dementia. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but if you stabilize it, like if it's associated with high blood pressure, for instance, and then your blood pressure gets treated, then exactly. you might progress. Right? That would be one of those modifiable conditions or manageable conditions. You're now this, this really surprises people. You can show the signs and symptoms of cognitive impairment with a urinary tract infection and both men and women. Yeah. They kind of fall off the edge at their capacity. I mean, I think people don't understand the 
burden of having bacteria in your body and all of the chemicals and the stress it is. Well, actually, I think they do now, right? Like COVID is an example how stressful a foreign actor, a virus in COVID's case or bacteria in a urinary tract infection can be on your whole body, right? And so that's one example where myocognitive impairment can be reversed. Right, right. That makes sense. Antibiotics. Once it gets into the bloodstream, it takes um, probably a couple of weeks after you um, take the full cycle of the antibiotics to get all the yuck out of your system. And then you go, go back to normal. And this is the biggest difference because I've had people come to me and tell me, I think my mom has Alzheimer's disease because just out of the blue, she just couldn't remember anything. She's really right. confused. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen in a 24 hour. All right. That's usually some sort of underlying stressor that is manifesting. That's right. Right. It's exactly. I said, it's, take your, your mother to the doctor and have them check right. for a urine right. and back and back. Right, right, right. Make sure they're healthy overall, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so like, what are like a couple of nuggets like for family? I mean, are there a couple of things like pieces of gold that you'd say, here are a couple of things you might need to think about if you have a family member with dementia? One very common behavior that we see with dementia is a person having false beliefs and paranoia, and some have hallucinations, some have delusions. My grandmother ran the gamut. She showed all of these behaviors. And our gut or instinctive reaction is to correct that person. Right. We want to bring them back to our reality. Right. What they're believing at that time, and I'm going to use a light bulb as an analogy, it's because the short term memory for that period of time, whether it's a minute, two hours, three days, it just got flipped off. Ah, right. The short term memory eventually um, diminishes completely. And but then um, our long term memory stays intact. So once we stop having our short-term memory to pull from, we pull from our long-term memory. So if this is common for somebody to think their their spouse who passed away, let's say years ago, believes they're still alive, and our instinctive reaction would, would be to correct them and say, oh, no, mom, don't you remember? Dad passed away five years ago. What are you talking about? Right. In her mind's eye, he's he's alive. alive. Right. Because she's pulling from her long-term memory because the short-term memory just got short-circuited, even though sure. it's temporary. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So a nugget that I think is probably one of the most important things family members or caregivers can do is what we call join their reality. You have to go along with their belief because, uh, uh, trust me, there is nothing anybody can say or do to change that person's belief until their short-term memory flips back on and they're back in our reality. So remediation is not going to work. Don't bother or don't try. No, it just causes, it just exacerbate the situation. Just they get more agitated or more agitated, more frustrated than, um, or angry, angry. You're telling that person their spouse is dead and they're saying, no, he's not. That's right. It could be like they're hearing it for the first time. And Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's great advice. I, that, that's so awesome. We call that joining their reality. And one of the ways that you know if it's happening is listen for the cues of what they're talking about. Sure. If talking about going out and playing tennis with, you know, the two eighth graders. And, you know, you're sitting there looking at an 85 year old woman. What is she talking about? You know that she's pulling from her long-term memory because her short-term memory just went kaput. Sure. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. With it. That's great advice. That's a great, I mean, I think that that is gold, right? Cause that really can eliminate a lot of the frustration that the, the family and care providers have, right. Rather than trying to correct all the time, because that's a lot of work too. It is. It is. So, that, that, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you think the listeners should know? Um, another thing that I think is really important to make aware of is there's a lot of behaviors that surface as a result of dementia. 
Mm -hmm. several of them. Um, What I think is very important for family members and caregivers to do is learn to recognize the behaviors and um, that the behaviors are part of the disease. Right. Not somebody trying to be difficult or um, antagonistic or anything like that. They are trying to communicate something to you. And the way, the only way that they are capable of doing that is through these behaviors. So if you recognize the behaviors as part of the disease, know that they're trying to tell you something and they're not, they're not just trying to be difficult. Right. Then you really kind of have to decode what the behavior means. And that, that takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. But it also takes away maybe some projected ill intent of some of the behaviors. Right. Because sometimes people think they're doing it because they're, they want to be mean or something, but they're exactly. not. It's, they've got exactly. some other motivation that you need to say. And that'll actually make you much happier as a family member, right? When it's you can figure not, out why they're really doing it. Right? It's usually they're trying to communicate something to you. That's I've had a great. lot of family members over the years tell me how hurt they are because they're, they went to visit their mother and their mother called them a different name and didn't recognize right. them again. That's, that's the disease speaking, not their mother. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. So Lisa, tell, you know, I love asking people this, you know, uh, as you've moved along in your career and your life, who, who do you thank is the people who were, you know, influenced you? I would say, as I'm journeying down this path for the last 25 plus years, my strength And my reinforcement came from the people that I helped, like the gal that said, you need to write a book. book. Yeah, yeah. Because it really just made me realize that I could make a difference in people's lives as they're going through this very difficult disease. Um, The other aspect of it, and it is really very similar to what you described you went through with your brother. You had to lose him twice. Right. You do the same thing with dementia. First, yeah. you lose the person that you knew. Right. And then you lose the new person. And then they pass away. Right. So it's a double whammy. You have yeah. to mourn that loss twice. And so I came to realize this really was a gift that was given to me. And it was based on experiences watching my own family members. And also the the many, 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 many families that I helped understand this disease while I was counseling them um, on, you know, should they leave their parent at home? Should they place them? All these things came up. The family dynamics were unbelievable. Everybody kind of had their own camps that they were in. And it's it's really, it tears families apart. Sure. So I thank the people that reinforced to me that I was really helping them out of a very tenuous situation. That's great. That's great work. That's really fulfilling. That's great stuff. So, so I, I also like to ask everybody, what's your favorite sound? We are a hearing loss uh, um, podcast. So uh, I'm always intrigued. What, what sound is the thing you like to hear the most? A heart. Oh, that's a beautiful instrument. That's a beautiful instrument. That's a good one. I haven't heard that. So, so Lisa, what's, what, can you tell the, the listeners about your book, what its name is and where they can find it and where they can find you? The name of the book is called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost, and it's available on Amazon. Right. And I also have a blog under the same name, and I invite people to come. Is, into is that the my- website or do they just Google Not oh, All Who Wander Need Be Lost? on Facebook. Uh, Facebook. The blog is on Facebook. So you just go on Facebook and you search not all who wander need be lost and it'll take you right to my blog. Okay. And hopefully that'll be an uh, additional resource for people because I share a lot of these tools and tips and updated information and things that I feel are important for people, excuse me, for people to know. So um, you can go on there and hopefully useful information. This has been great, Lisa. You've really shared some great information, insights. I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast. Everybody, this is uh, Lisa Skinner has been on there. Thanks so much for coming on to Listen Up. It's been great having you as a guest. Thanks for having me. Uh, This has been great. Thanks again. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.